Hello, thanks for stopping in. Let me take a moment to introduce myself. I'm Bill. I'm a retired U.S. Coast Guard and Merchant Marine veteran, home builder, and city mayor. After the Coast Guard, I joined the Sailors Union of the Pacific, the SUP out of Seattle, and spent the, uh, the next nine years of my life raising uh, hell <laughs> in about 30 different seaports around the world. And uh, I've managed to accumulate a, an interesting little list of, of uh, adventures. And after about 40 years of pestering from both of my wives, I decided to uh, start recording uh, a couple of these before they're just lost to senility. And uh, I am an old sailor, so I do use some salty language at times here, so uh, you've been warned. And this is chapter one. This event we're going to talk about today was in the spring of 1978 at the Coast Guard uh, Watchtower inside the South Jetty at the Coos River uh, in Coos Bay, Oregon. Now I'd been standing tower watches and answering the phone, Tower Schaefer, for a, a while at this point. Now the, uh, the tower even today is in a, is in a fairly remote location. There, there wasn't any uh, improved roads to get up there from the base of the hill by the Charleston Boat Basin where it starts. It was just a, a simple, steep, twisty, one narrow lane gravel path all the way up to the tower. Um, hell, to be honest, the road's still pretty shitty, especially up towards the top today, but it is what it is, and, and there's just no other way to get there. Anyway, you didn't have a whole lot of casual traffic uh, up there. It was mostly just fishermen checking the bar, or their uh, wives would come up and call down reports to the boat. But nobody just drives their pretty little car up there. It's usually locals. And uh, the wives were actually the worst for this. If the, uh, the weather was particularly bad or if it was just too damn cold and their, their heater wasn't quite cutting it, hell, they wouldn't think anything of just marching up the steps and, and walk right in the tower. Uh, you know, check out bar conditions and the tides, uh, just see who's been going in and out, that sort of thing. And a uh, couple of the regulars, a couple of the wives who came up would uh, usually bring me up a cup of coffee, and that was pretty sweet. See, the, the boat basin is a, is a pretty small, tight community, actually, and, and everybody knows the boat crews, uh, for good or bad. And uh, back in the day, it was, it was a different world. Uh, there weren't any security fences uh, around the tower uh, like there is now, or, or even door locks. I mean, hell, the, the tower was never unmanned, so what's the lock? Uh, you know, anybody could and, and did just walk right up. It was also pretty sweet for the duty officer. You know, he could really fuck with somebody if he thought they were, you know, sleeping on watch or smoking a little something they shouldn't be. It was easy. You just shut the lights off on your rig and park about 30 yards around the corner and tippy-toe right up the steps. Surprise! Yeah, every every new arrival when they started their tower watches, and including myself, could look forward to uh, several of those little mine trips. Yeah, good times. Now, when I uh, when I first arrived at the station, I was an SN. I was a a, a seaman on uh, BM3 Bill Bethel's boat crew on the 44361. Now, Bill was from the South Coast area originally and had worked on uh, logging crews for uh, a couple of years uh, or several years before joining the Guard. Now, I'd also worked uh, for a, a couple of years after high school uh, in construction and then for Campbell Crane and rigging in Portland. So Bill and I were, were actually of a, a similar age and uh, general worldliness, if you will, and we got tight pretty quick. And uh, Bill was the type who had to, to know and feel comfortable with you before he would really talk much uh, about anything that wasn't the boats. So it took a while, you know, it took four months or whatever, four or five months, several hangovers and a, you know, a couple good scrapes at the <laughs> Basin Tavern. And uh, in another clip I'll tell you how I got to be known around the Basin as Captain Crunch. But then uh, Bill would start to open up a little bit and talk about things, uh, especially stuff they might see or hear uh, logging back in the deep woods in the southern coast mountain range. In fact, you can Google today 
for example, for uh, West Coast Bigfoot hotspots, in this entire Southern Oregon, Northern California coastal area is just one giant red zone for sightings. And uh, if you believe in this sort of thing, which I do growing up here, I mean, I, I do. And if, if you do believe in this sort of thing, this is where they are. Now he would always kind of, you know, just kind of slide sideways into mentioning a, a strange footprint they'd find, for example, or some weird hoot or bent over tree not to really make any claims one way or the other, just bring them up kind of casual and, and always watching my reactions. So you got to remember, back in the 70s, there wasn't any interweb, there's no Google, there's no smartphones. I mean, hell, there's no cell phones at all for another six years or so. And uh, cable TV really hadn't made it this far down the food chain. Uh, there's very few cable boxes. Uh, we basically had a half a dozen TV channels and a couple of nightly news programs. That's about it. So the uh, the whole general acceptance of the possibility of a giant something living in some remotely uh, remotely wooded areas just really wasn't a thing, unless you actually lived in one of these potential areas and, and knew someone who knew someone. Then this whole subject would have never gotten anywhere near your radar. Now. Bill would start kind of slow, then he'd drop, start dropping little comments uh, about, uh, oh, I don't know, 16-inch footprints that we'd find around the equipment in the mornings. Uh, some weird yells, you know, a couple thrown rocks, uh, that sort of thing. I mean, it was the whole bit. Then one day, Bill and I are by ourselves down in the boathouse, just working on the 361. You know, just typical dicking around bullshit. And he kind of stops and turns to me real serious and says, uh, you know, I saw one at the tower. And I just looked at him straight in the eye and I said, you saw what? He says, man, I saw one about a year ago. I was on four to eight tower watch. And one morning around 0500, I was hanging outside the door having a smoke, and I caught some movement along the little brushy tree line behind the tower, and I saw something big. It was over six foot, moving real slow along the uh, brush line in the shadows, and then disappeared over the cliff. Now you can Google map this if you want for context, but the Coos Bay Watchtower is just inside the jetties on the south side of the Coos River. And there, once inside, the river then bends up to the north around to uh, the city proper, Coos Bay. And then back around behind you to the south is the, the boat basin in Charleston. And that's where the, the boat station itself is located. Now, the tower sits on a tall stone outcrop overlooking uh, Guano Rock. And it's kind of like a little cliffs of Dover standing about 60 feet or so above the water line or above the water and at that time there was just a simple little split rail fence a little wood fence back from the edge about 20 feet um, I mean hell it was just a suggestion it wasn't really a fence of any kind and there's a number of small caves and crevices in that outcrop under the tower and there's one in particular that passes all the way through under the tower now, I've never been down there personally, but we had a, a little MK3 Eddie who claimed to have crawled most all the way through it, but it was pretty jammed up with logs. He couldn't, couldn't really make it by himself. But he said back inside there was an opening, and it just stank like a dead bear back in there, and he got pretty creeped out and never went back in it again. Um, so, again, I can't personally confirm it, but that's what I was told. And as a side note... Eddie uh, was, was this just perpetually cheerful little Mexican who, who loved to take off on his free time and he would just explore and hike along the uh, cliffs and the footpaths along the coast. You know, he'd go, <coughs> go for an overnight or something on his free time. And in fact, he, uh, he found a body in a sleeping bag back in the woods and uh, turned out this guy had been missing for oh, going on two years or so. And uh, Eddie uh, brought the guy's ID out and reported where he could be found and actually got a nice little write-up in the, the local Coos Bay paper then. It was a good thing. 
So when he told me that there was something like this under the tower, I had no reason not to believe him, uh, so I did. Now, Bill said they used to leave fruit out for uh, whatever was stomping around their logging equipment overnight, uh, just as a, a goof at first, but then they just kept doing it, trying to, you know, keep it happy so it wouldn't mess with anything. So when he had the four to eights, Bill said he thought it would be funny to start sticking an apple or something on a, a broken branch at the tree line there behind the tower uh, when he had the four to eights, when he'd go on at three, uh, 350. And uh, pretty soon, apples started disappearing. I mean, they'd be gone at 745 when he got relieved with no crumbs, no pieces left underneath, just gone. And uh, that's when he saw it. He started paying a lot more attention than uh, behind the tower as well as seaward. And uh, that's when he saw it, just that one time. Now, and remember, there's no fences, there's no locks, and there's a really big something eating your apples 100 feet from the tower door. Yeah. Now, he said the whole scenario was kind of mind-blowing, but now he's afraid to stop bringing fruit. You know, he's established a precedent. He doesn't want to, you know, upset this thing. And he's telling me all this while I'm still standing tower watches. Now, at this point, it's going to be another almost six weeks or so before I get my stripe, and I didn't have to do this shit anymore. So now, here I am. I'm standing what I hope is going to be my, my final set of four to eights, and like a dumbass, I think it'd be funny to start sticking some fruit on a broken branch at the tree line behind the tower and just see what happens. And I'll be goddamned if after about five days or so, they didn't start disappearing. And again, no scraps, no pieces, nothing left over with uh, some nibble marks from a squirrel, just gone. Not every day, maybe, you know, two or three days in a row, and then skip a day or two, and, you know, then they'd disappear again. Uh, but it was real consistent. And I can't talk about this to anybody except Bill, because first of all, I hadn't actually seen anything. What am I going to talk about? And Bill's wife knew about some of the stuff they ran into up at the uh, timber sites, but nothing about this tower bullshit. And they lived in a little house close to the base of the hill where the tower road started. And if she thought there was some kind of damn monster in their backyard, man, she'd snatch up the kids off to Eugene to her mother's, and that would be it. And number two, again, this is the late 70s. Uh, during this time, airline pilots are losing their licenses, being deemed unstable. Military pilots are being grounded, reassigned for simply reporting a UFO sighting. Uh, air traffic control uh, personnel are, are being fired, uh, put on, uh, you know, uh, perpetual leave uh, for reporting weird uh, UFO blips. In the uh, Patterson-Gimlin video of a Bigfoot walking up a creek bed in Northern California had been released in 1967, about 11 years before, but anybody associated with it or who publicly supported the idea was pretty roundly smashed as a kook. And uh, please do, go ahead and Google uh, the Patterson-Gimlin Bigfoot video, or just the, the Patterson Bigfoot video. Now, they caught a solid 30 seconds of a seven-footer clearly striding up a creek bed, and to this day that video has never been credibly debunked and is considered to be basically the smoking gun for Bigfoot sightings. And they famously gave this film to uh, Kodak and NASA uh, back in the day to try to break this down and debunk it, and they never could. The, the film is genuine. And it was filmed about 200 miles down the coast from Coos Bay in Humboldt County, California, uh, in the neighborhood of uh, Orleans, California, I think it was. But it's Humboldt County, Northern California. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyway, you just didn't talk about this shit. So now I've got a, a, a week left on the four to eights before I rotate. I'm walking out to my Bronco at 0340 with a banana in my pocket, chuckling to myself that I'm giving treats to a fucking monster that lives up at the tower. And 
in a couple more weeks I'll have my stripe and I'm done with this tower bullshit. And then I'm chuckling thinking, man, what's old big boy going to do when he stops getting his treats? And I'm just laughing, man, no fence, no locks. I thought this was just hilarious. So jump in the Bronco, turn the ignition, and nothing. So you got to be shitting me tonight. You got to do this tonight. Okay, let's try it again. Pump the gas. <laughs> click, click, click. Yeah, you got to be fucking kidding me. What the hell am I going to do now? Man, when you get that first little icy flash of adrenaline, your mind just starts spinning. What the hell are you going to do? Because it's not the, the, the mile or so uh, from here to the tower that's got me cursing my birth and shitting greasy ice cubes. Hell, I could trot that in a full pack in 20 minutes. It's the three quarters of that mile on a dark, twisty, narrow, goat fuck of a path through the deep woods where I've been leaving treats for something that I'd really rather not be thinking about right now. And this was a Sunday morning. I remember Monday was one of those half-assed holidays. Uh, but it was just enough to where there wasn't anybody at the station. Uh, at least nobody I could borrow a car from at 3 in the morning. So I called the tower. I say, look, man, my Bronco's tits up, won't start. And there's nobody down here. Just, you know, run down and pick me up. And, uh, yeah, I got about what I expected, which was a, a hail and hearty, fuck you, hurry your ass up. Which is uh, exactly what I would have said. So, okay, there's no getting around it. I'm going to have to walk it. A couple of deep breaths. I'm psyching myself up, saying, you know, what the hell are you afraid of? You're a six foot one, 210 pound football monster. Just grit your teeth and move. So I do the smart thing. First thing I do is I head back into the kitchen and I grab an orange and two carrots <laughs> to, to go along with my banana. I figure if that thing's up there, I'm feeding him. You know, I want, the <laughs> I want him happy. You know, I'm gonna take fruit up to him. And, uh, on, on my way out the door, too, I figured it'd be a good idea. I grab a fire axe. I figure, uh, at least if I see that thing on the trail, I guess I can throw my carrots, buy enough time to kill myself with the axe. Uh, but anyway, I've got my supplies, I, th I figure, and uh, here I go. yippee ki -yay. Now, this is a, a usual early morning in the fall. In the fall. It's foggy. But the first quarter mile or so is uh, from the station is flat. Uh, there's some street lighting. It's easy. Then you get to the base of the hill where this goat path starts. And you're just looking at this big black hole disappearing into the deep woods. Now, it was unfortunate timing for me that I had, uh, within about the last month or so, had just finished reading The Lord of the Rings. So I have this vision in my head right now of Gandalf descending into the mines of Moria hunting the goddamn Balrog. Now, folks, you got to understand, fall in the coastal deep woods at 0345 in the foggy morning, this takes darkness to an entirely new dimension. And that is the moment it dawns on me I don't have a fucking flashlight. I got an axe, by God, and a pocket full of carrots, but I can't see my damn feet. Oh, I can't go back. It's too far. I'm committed now. Jesus, so much for Samper Paradis. I am not prepared for this shit. Now, right now, I am running on pure adrenaline. Cursing the gods, questioning my birth, 
wondering what the fuck I did wrong in my life to put me here right now. So I have this tick where I kind of shrug my shoulders and crack my neck. <laughs> kind of like what I'm doing right now when I know I'm heading into a fight. And I'm a born bosun's mate. I'm on a mission and I got a big fucking axe. So I may be marching to my death, but by God, I'm going down swinging. So I start my shuffle through the pitch black fog, just like a goddamn Stephen King novel, and I literally can't see my feet. So I figure out pretty quick that as long as you just literally shuffle, you slide your feet in one of the tire ruts as you're going up, um, you know, it's real slow going, but it keeps you on the road. And really, the only remarkable thing about the hike up was, was just how utterly silent it was. I mean, all the way up, not a single sound of any kind. No critters, no nothing. You're just enveloped in this eerie black fog with no sensory input at all except for your heart just pounding in your throat that got to be more unnerving than anything I mean I was almost hoping for something to swing my axe at well you know almost but I finally shuffled my way up the hill and around the last corner and start to see the tower silhouetted in the fog now, at this point, I'm 25 minutes or better, you know, late on this guy. I owe him big time. You, you just don't do that on watches. But I made it in one piece. I mean, I could damn sure use a change of underwear, but I cheated death once again, by God. So now I've got the adrenaline shakes. I mean, my whole body's just shaking, and I just want to get inside the tower. Now, I leave the banana and the carrots in the tree, but... For some reason, I just can't force myself to let go of that orange. I, I guess it just feels too much like a baseball in my hand. And I can flat fucking sling a baseball. And I still got to get back down the hill in another three hours or so. And I wasn't really thinking about this then, but looking back on it now, you know, over the years, I, I, I've got this, this vision in my head of an orange just exploding on this thing's forehead and then have it just look at me and shake his head and uh, at that point I, I ship myself inside out and die but the, <laughs> the watch itself was quiet it was pretty heavy fog so there's nothing to see there's no boat movement you just sit there and monitor the radios and you can't see the tree line behind you because it's too foggy to watch the fruit so I'm back in the Stephen King novel The Fog for another three hours and then hopefully I'll be able to catch a ride back down with one of the uh, regulars that come up to look and normally around sunrise you know the tower will get a couple calls for a radio check or a bar report uh, from one of the boats in the basin but this morning 0700, 715, 730 no calls, no cars the basin's dead, so I'm back to walking again. Now at 0745, my relief rolls up, and he's on time. And this time of year at 0745, the skyline is just starting to lighten up. And this is actually that in-between time that really messes you up. It's just light enough to ruin your night vision, but it's not light enough to let you actually see anything. And uh, any sailor knows exactly what I'm talking about. And you throw in the fog, and I'm now I'm uh, now not any better off than I was at uh, 3:45. And no, I knew better than to go back and beg Steve to borrow his car and then come back for him. Back then, there just wasn't a whole lot of sympathy between watchstanders. I mean, when when you jam a bunch of uh, mostly young men together in one place they will tend to derive much enjoyment from a shipmate's temporary misery. And uh, even better if it involves rain or cold. And I had been on the giving end of more than my share of this shit, so it was my turn in the barrel. So I grabbed my axe, 
which Steve thought was pretty damn funny until he saw the look on my face and then he stopped laughing. I didn't think it was funny. Down the steps. I start moving across the little parking area and on the right hand corner just before the road actually begins is the tree where Bill and I have been leaving goodies. And as I'm getting closer, you know, I'm praying to myself. I'm just saying, oh, please, God, let the banana be there. Let it be there. Please be there. Nope. The banana's gone. Carrots, too. Now, this is a point where you're going to have to pardon my saltiness here a little bit. Because right now, this shit just got real fucking serious. This is no longer just a walk through the creepy woods. It's up here. And there's a real good fucking chance it's within 200 yards of me right now. Oh, man. <laughs> I wish you could see my hands are shaking. Um, anyway, over about the next two seconds... I have a 20-minute conversation with myself going over about 35 different what-the-fuck-now scenarios. And I come to the conclusion that, first of all, I'm not going begging back to the tower. That shit ain't happening. This is my mess, and I'm going to clean it up. And this thing's probably over the cliff anyway. That appears to be his M.O. He pops out of the tree line, he hits the snack bar, and then he goes down to his cave. Jesus Christ, that's what I'm hoping for anyway. My fallback is that my scent is all over the fruit he's been eating for the last three weeks. He's going to smell me. I mean, he's got to know that I'm the guy. I'm his buddy. Now you look up through the trees, and again, the sky is just starting to lighten. Uh, but down in the foggy woods, man, it's still zero dark 30. So I'm back to my slow shuffle down the tire rut. I figured to approach this like I was in bear country. You know, you talk, you make noise, uh, you let them know you're there. So I, I try to, to whistle a, a merry tune, and there's no saliva, <laughs> so there's nothing there. And so I just try real hard to keep the frightened little whimper out of my voice and just start babbling. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> How's life under the tower? How long you been down there? I hope you enjoy the fruit. I've been stealing from the kitchen to pack it up here for you. And uh, be sure to let me know if there's any special requests. I'll be more than happy to, to bring it up here for you. You know, just, just make a noise. Just whatever comes out of your head. And it's helping to calm, keep me calm too. But it doesn't take long. I'm maybe two, three hundred yards from the tower, and I think I hear something pacing me off to my right. Hundred, hundred feet, I don't know, maybe two hundred, but not very far. You know, I'd walk along, I'd think I hear something, and you stop, and you hear that one more footprint. Maybe two. Soft, but heavy. And then nothing. And then you start to walk and you listen and then you hear it. You think you hear it. And then you stop and you hear that one more footprint and then nothing. And it continues like this all the way down the hill. Now, oh, I wish you could see me. I'm, I'm shaking. <laughs> you cannot even imagine the experience of the next half a mile shuffling through the blind fog. I mean, it, it starts with just a flash of sheer, stark terror and slowly morphs into a kind of just resigned acceptance of your fate. Where just don't stop. Keep moving. Keep talking. Becomes everything. Now, I was born and raised in Western Oregon. I went to Canby and North Marion High Schools. I've been deer and elk hunting many times, and I've been up close and personal, meaning damn near touching distance with a black bear and damn near that close to a bull elk, 
So I'm pretty familiar with, you know, normal forest sounds and, and movements. And whatever this thing was, was heavy and walked softly and with purpose. It moved when I moved and it stopped when I stopped. Other than that, it made no noise at all. And I had a good long time paying hyper attention to its movements. And it was not my imagination. Now this goes on for what seems like a couple hours. Until I finally see a brightening at the bottom of the hill. The opening in the trees at the bottom of the hill about 30 yards away. And that breaks the spell. I can't control it anymore. I, I just bust into a screaming full panic sprint the last 60 yards to that light post at the main road, and there I just stop. You know, you lean back against the pole, I'm shaking and gasping, and you know, there's tears coming, <laughs> tears coming down my face. Just looking back at that hole in the trees, Jesus Christ, I made it. Now I called Bill after breakfast, told him what happened, he just laughed. But he made sure to remind me not to spread any of this shit around the station, because if they got back to his wife, he would bury me at sea. And uh, <laughs> no problem, I had no intention of becoming the station joke for the next year or two. And uh, I never did. Now Bill, Bill let me borrow his dirt bike for the next two or three days while I put a new fuel pump in the Bronco. So no, I never did, nor will I ever walk that road again. But I do enjoy driving up there from time to time, check out the surf, and uh, <laughs> then I'll just look up at the tower sometimes and shake my head, thinking, man, you got no idea. But then I guess that's what the, us old sea dogs are for, tell stories, scare the kids. So that's my Bigfoot at the Coos Bay Watchtower story, and it did actually happen just like that. I lived it. In about a mo another month or so, I had my stripe and then got fully qualified as a 44 and 52 coxswain, uh, later designated as a heavy weather. Then I was given the 44408 uh, along with my MK3, Greg Eskew, and Seaman John Warner. And man, the three of us were legendary. And I'll have a, a couple of good stories about that you might enjoy too. And if you did enjoy this, well, please share it with your friends. Spread the bullshit a little bit and consider sub, uh, subscribing. Give it a like. Over the last year or so, I've been compiling a little list of, of chapters like this, of some of the little adventures I've been on around the world. I've been pretty fortunate in my travels in uh, I've been in some sort of mischief in over 30 seaports in about 35 countries around the world and I want to start recording uh, a few of these while I can still remember them. So please come along for the ride if you care to. I think the next one is going to be uh, something about the, uh, the Great Sunset Bay Golf Ball Catastrophe of 1979. Yeah, that was a fun one. We, uh, we put somebody out of business with that one. <laughs> so. Uh, and now, folks, thanks for attending, and meetings adjourned.